All right, truly is a pleasure to be here with you all this evening. I appreciate the invite. I think it's great that Brother Brett was able to keep this thing alive and, and get everyone coming together. And I appreciate all the hard work also that Pastor Mejia has been doing, getting all the equipment here and doing the stream and getting everything set up as well. So a lot of work has been going into this behind the scenes. So uh, uh, get, make sure you give these guys a thank you, a big thank you, especially for you know, every you that are here, they're able to come and, and enjoy this. I love it. I appreciate it. So thank you, gentlemen, because... I mean, this is great for, for the pastors just as much as it is for everyone else that comes and shows up. I love hearing the preaching and the fellowship, and I love seeing a lot of faces that I've already met before and some new ones that I have not met yet. So uh, it's, it's a really great to be here at the, the Fundamentalist Conference. And you know what? Um, there's always going to be haters, and they're going to continue to get worse and worse. And, uh, but you know what? The, the heathen's going to rage. We know they're going to rage. They're going to try to shut things down. But guess what? Here we are. Are they going to keep on trying, you know, and even if we didn't have a nice place with nice seating and everything else, this conference would still go on. I, think, I wouldn't drive up here and say, oh, no, you don't, have, you don't have a hotel. Well, guess what? We'd be going somewhere and preaching. And, I, you know, I, I don't care how difficult they want to make it. Some loser who has no life at all and just, care, you know, they're, they're so angry. They want to shut down people who are preaching basic Bible truths, which by the way, this is the fundamentalist conference, right? Which fundamentalism is just, you know, it goes down to the, to the basics, to the root, to the foundation, core Christian doctrines. You know, I, I don't know who wants to fight against that except these antichrists that just hate God and hate the work that's being done and hate the, hate the doctrine, good doctrine from the Bible. Um, otherwise, I don't, you know, I don't understand why you'd even want to try to shut down a conference like this. And the title of my sermon this evening is that the Bible teaches fundamentalism. I know shortly after I got saved, you know, I didn't get saved from a, from a soul winner going door to door. Obviously, I'd heard the gospel at some point, but I, I didn't have someone directly leading me the moment that I called on the name of the Lord. And, um, so it was, it was kind of, I, I didn't get led in the right direction immediately because I didn't have a lot of influences kind of helping to guide me and show me, hey, where's the, you know, where's the best place to go to church? And, and I had a brother that actually helped me. Uh, he gave me some information on the King James Bible shortly after I got saved. And that just clicked. It made sense. I mean, you hear the word of God, whereas before you get saved, your eyes are kind of blinded. You, you, know, you can't understand the Bible at all. Natural man doesn't receive the things of God. But after you get saved, it's just, it, you know, the whole book, it's opened up. And even though I had a lot to learn, like every new believer does, it's still a, a completely different experience reading the scripture. And you, can, you hear the voice of the shepherd. And you know that that's the truth. And there's a lot of things that are just intuitive when you start to learn and you're, and you're seeking out the truth, God will lead you in that direction because you have the Holy Spirit, because it's going to help guide you into all truth. And what I want to teach this evening is that the Bible actually teaches fundamentalism. So what, how did I become an independent, fundamental, Baptist church member, right? How did I even find it? Well, because it's what the Bible teaches. And, that, and that's ultimately why we should believe anything that we believe is because you could find it in Scripture. You're trying to find the churches. You're trying to find the people who are teaching the Bible in a way that is accurate and right and just spot on. Now, there's people who are just going to stand up and preach, thus saith the Lord. That's why I'm a fundamentalist. Now, it, the, the name doesn't even, it, it could never have existed, but people will still be, be preaching the truth in its pure form, just say, preaching the Bible what it sa for what it says. Right? There's too many people these days that want to change what Scripture says. They don't like what it says, so they'll just try to explain it away. Right? You read passages in Scripture, and, oh, well, that's not really what it means, because that couldn't be what it means. Well, you know what? It's what it says. And fundamentalism, in a nutshell, is we believe the Bible for what it says. And we don't try to add our own spin to it and make it say something it doesn't. We take the Word of God and say, thus saith the Lord, and this is what it is. So I'm going to go through some points here on how the Bible teaches fundamentalism. And in order to do this, I'm going to start with a definition that I, that I pulled from Wikipedia. Okay, and you can go to a dictionary or whatever. I don't have a problem with the word, you know, with the term fundamentalism or even how it's ne defined necessarily. I, I think the one in Wikipedia is okay. It's, there's nothing, 
you know, th there might be some things I'd change a little bit here and there, but it's not that big of a deal. It's a basic truth that we're going to get across here. And I'm actually going to use this definition as my outline to show how the Bible teaches that, yeah, all these things that are being said here about what fundamentalism is, is taught in scripture, <laughs> exactly why we're fundamentalists. So uh, I'm going to read this to you. You can look this up later if you want. Fundamentalism, Wikipedia says, usually has a religious connotation that indicates unwavering attachment to a set of irreducible beliefs, right? So we don't waver in, uh, in our attachment, our association with these beliefs that you break down. Irreducible means you can't keep breaking it down lower and lower. So it's at the foundation, at the lowest level, Right. However, fundamentalism has come to be applied to a tendency among certain groups, mainly, although not exclusively, in religion, that is characterized by a markedly strict literalism as it is applied to certain specific scriptures, dogmas, or ideologies, and a strong sense of the importance of maintaining in-group and out-group distinctions, leading to an emphasis on purity and the desire to return to a previous ideal from which advocates believe members have strayed. Rejection of diversity of opinion as applied to these established fundamentals and their accepted interpretation within the group often results from this tendency. So it's a lot of, a lot of words there. You know, don't worry. I'm going to go through this point by point, though, and explain why this is accurate. This definition, by and large... Is, is accurate, and this is actually taught. All these points are taught in Scripture. And I'm going to start off just by saying this. You know, fundamentalism is the only, is, is, you know, a fundamentalist religion is a pure religion. It's one where, and, and I don't care what the religion is. I, I, I have more respect for any of the fundamentalists, and I don't mean respect and I respect what they believe, just in the respect that, hey, if you're going to believe something, why don't you just believe everything that it's saying? You know, if you're going to go off and believe, you know, in Islam, you're going to become a Muslim. Why don't you just believe like all the teachings that your holy texts say, if they're supposed to be coming from God, then why don't you believe everything that it says and just, and just take it to its extreme and just believe it all, right? And don't cherry pick. And then you got the same thing with the, with the Mormons, the Latter-day Satans, you know, I mean, hey, if you're going to, you're going to believe in your prophet, Joseph Smith, that he's really a prophet from God, then hey, just take it all. Right? Why, why are you just picking and, oh, no, this, you know, look, take it all. Just be a fundamentalist in that belief. And you know what? Christianity, if you're going to believe the Bible, if you're going to believe in Jesus Christ, believe all of it. Believe the whole Bible. Just, just take it all. Believe it for what it says. Don't pick and choose the parts that you like and the parts you don't like and, and water down certain areas. Oh, that's a little bit too harsh. Look, let's just, let's just take it all. There's integrity in that. We're into, we started off here in Hebrews chapter 5. Look at Hebrews chapter 6, though, real quick. As I, as, you know, this is all just by way of introduction. The Bible says in verse number 1, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Now, these are principles. These are the first things. These are the, the, the things you get to first in the faith, right? You have to have these things established. The doctrine of Christ, right? That, that's primary. Salvation is primary, right? You, you, you can't be a believer until you believe the doctrine of Christ, of who he was, the, you know, ever, all that he did for us. He, rose, he died, rose again from the dead. You know, he's the son of God. You got to believe all these things, the doctrine of Christ. And he's saying, you know what? We're going we're gonna to leave that because you should already have that foundation. So he's going to go on to perfection, meaning adding more to that. Now, we're not going to continue adding more to that. This is a fundamentalist conference, and I'm going to teach just on what the fundamental, you know, fundamentalism, what it is, and, and kind of um, how the Bible teaches that. But then he lists other things here. He says, not laying again the foundation. Again, talking about foundational principles. Repentance from dead works, right? We're not trusting in our works. This is, again, tied into to salvation, 
We're not trusting in how good we are. We're not trusting in our works to be saved and of faith toward God because we have faith in Jesus Christ of the doctrine of baptisms and laying out of hand, resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. These are all things that are just real basic, real primary things. Now, as fundamentalists, we don't want to lose sight of these things. We do continue to go on under perfection. We don't just stay at this level of primacy. But as a fundamentalist, you don't want these things. These things are just unalterable. These are immutable. These are unchangeable. These are, these are some core doctrines that define and, and everything else needs to be built upon. Now, as believers, we're going to end up Every single believer is probably going to end up having some disagreement on how you understand certain doctrines in Scripture and, and just, you know, you're, you're going to have differences of opinion in different areas, right? We're going to think that, oh, I think this means this, or you know, and, and it's going to be more nuanced. It's going to be uh, more particular on, on, on some doctrine, but it's not going to be the foundational things, right? If you can't agree on the foundational things, we're not believing the same thing at all. I mean, if you, if you don't believe the same method of salvation, you know, you're not even saved. I mean, that's what it boils down to. And these are things that just, there is no arguing. There is no debate. We're not going to have a discussion on, well, let's see, you say this and I say this and, and, you know, we'll see who's right. No, these fundamentals, the fundamental truths are right. They're not up for debate. And one of the things I think is, I find is interesting is that the people who shy away from, oh, you're a fundamentalist and stuff, especially those that, are, that call themselves Christian, almost all of them are going to be these Christians that, yeah, you don't, you don't stick to any fundamentals. You know, you, just, you, you don't really stick to any doctrine at all. You, you think everything is up for discussion and everything is, is on the table for, oh, well, let's talk about that. Oh, well, what Bible do you have? Oh, I've got this one. Let's see what yours says and we'll see what mine says. And there's no foundation. There's no solid rock there. There's nothing to start from. And what the Bible says, we started off in Hebrews chapter 5 at the end of that passage before it goes into chapter 6 about the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Look at verse number 12. The Bible says, For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. And what he's saying is, you know, you've, you've been saved for a long time. You've been around this. You've been exposed to this. You know, you've had the Bible. You've had people preaching. You have all this stuff. And he says, you should be teachers by this point. You know, at, at a certain point in your life, in your spiritual life, you're expected to grow. You're expected to receive and learn and grow. And he's saying, you've been around this for so long. Hey, you should be able to teach other people now. And he's saying, but you're not. And it's a shame because now you need someone to teach you again the basics. It's like, you know, <laughs> you're 25 years old, 30 years old. You should be at an education level of like being able to teach grammar school, right? And he's saying, you got to go back to kindergarten. You got to learn your alphabet. You got to learn basic sentences and words. You know, you got to go back to the foundations. You need to go back to the principles. That, that's what it's like for the people who just disregard the primacy and the importance of having those fundamentals and aren't willing to keep those fundamentals at all costs. He says, for, in verse 13, for everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Right? When you're born again, everyone who's born again, the day you get born again, you're a babe in Christ. It's a brand new birth. Of course you're a babe. And there's nothing wrong with being a babe when you first get saved. There's nothing wrong with, with having a baby when they're, they're just born, or of course they're a baby, right? And babies are going to cry, and babies don't understand very much, and babies need to learn, they need to grow. But I'll tell you what, if you've got, if you've got a 25-year-old a son in your house, and he's still acting like a baby and throwing temper tantrums, you know, that's a problem. There's something wrong with that picture. And this is the, the spiritual situation, unfortunately, of many Christians, that they, they've been saved for a really long time, and man, for all that time you've been saved, you ought to be able to teach other people. And nope, you're still in need of the milk. You're still in need of the basics. And with fundamentalism, we're not going to let that stuff go. We need, we need to make sure that all of those uh, stay pertinent and are taught, and we never stray from those fundamentals. Verse 14 says, But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, 
even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And then, of course, it jumps into chapter 6, where he's saying, yeah, these are the principles, these are the foundations, and we're going to move on unto perfection in the rest of Hebrews there. Now, the definition I started with from Wikipedia, the first thing that it said is that there's an unwavering attachment to a set of irreducible beliefs. These are the fundamentals. These are the, the core doctrines. Turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. We're going to show how does the Bible teach that we ought to have an unwavering attachment to a set of irreducible beliefs. Well, it teaches it in many places. I'm just going to give you two examples. Okay, the irreducible belief that is being brought up in Galatians chapter 2 is salvation itself. Okay, you can't break it down any further. That's at the lowest level. That's at the foundation. That's at the core, how you get saved. Right, how, what, what must I do to be saved, right? Well, hey, we believe, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But there were many people at this time, especially in Galatia, that were trying to bring works and add works into salvation. They were teaching, well, no, no, you also got to be circumcised, right? Believing's not enough. You got to be circumcised. Today, you've got people that say, oh, no, believing's not enough. You got to be baptized, right? Or any other fill in the blank. No, no, it's not enough. You got to do this. You got to do that. You got to keep the law of Moses. You got to at least keep these laws. You got to do whatever, right? And that attacks the fundamentals. Well, Galatians chapter 2, verse number 3, the Bible reads, but neither Titus, who was with me being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they may bring us into bondage. So he's saying these false brethren, these, these, these wicked people came in, they're not even saved, right? They're, they're acting like they're saved and they're trying to bring in this damnable heresy. They're trying to bring in a works-based salvation and trying to draw people away and bring them back into bondage and, um, and, and get them, get their minds wrapped up in this works. And look at what he says in verse five though. He says, to whom we gave place by subjection. No, not for an hour. So that they sit down and talk and be like, well, let me hear you out. Let's see. Why do you think that circumcision is, I mean, maybe we're wrong here. Maybe we do need to keep circumcision. Maybe that's something that we should look at. Is that what they did? No, they, they know that it's not of circumcision. They know that it's only faith. They know there's, there's nothing that is going to change their mind that, that faith in Jesus Christ is the only way to be saved. There's nothing's going to change their mind. It's, it's unwavering. That's why it says, you know what? We gave place by subjection, not even for an hour. We're not going to listen to them and be subject unto what they're trying to teach. It says that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. And they fought that the whole length. Even when you know, other people came in and said, well, we'll go to, back to Jerusalem and, and let's talk to the apostles. It says like, they're like, Apostle Paul and Barnabas are like, we, we know what the truth is. We don't have any reason to go back and, and confirm with anybody else what the truth is. That's unwavering. Okay, that's an unwavering faith and an irreducible belief that you just are not going to change. That's part of what fundamentalism is. In Jude verse 3, the Bible says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. It's something we should be willing to fight for. Again, there's no compromise there. When it comes to the foundations, when it comes to the fundamentals, there's no compromise. That's part of being a fundamentalist, and this is taught very clearly in Scripture. And again, you know, for sake of time, I'm only turning to one or two verses for all of these points, because there's kind of a lot of points in this definition. I want to make sure I get through them all. The next point in this definition, and again, this is, this, the definition is coming from Wikipedia. This is the world's definition, right? And, and it, but I think it's applicable. I think it's just fine to be labeled a fundamentalist, whether the world's labeling at you or whether you're labeling yourself, because the definition is true and it's accurate. And again, I'm not speaking for every definition. I didn't look up every definition, but this one seems to fit just fine. Second Peter chapter one, their next point in their definition was that it's characterized, fundamentalism is characterized by a markedly strict literalism. Amen. Amen. I mean, as fundamentalists, more so than any other Christian denomination, they're going to be called a literalist. I mean, we literally believe the Bible to be true. When, when the Bible says whatever it says, do you believe that literal? Yeah. Do you believe that their water covered the whole earth? 
Yeah, I do. I literally believe that because the Bible literally says that, that the water went over the, the highest mountains. And I know that there's these, you know, the TV shows out there that try to explain away all the miracles of the Bible and all the things that happen that, that might seem kind of extreme, which, yeah, the world being covered in water is very extreme. I mean, this is an extreme measure. We have an extreme God that took an extreme measure on people and wiped them all out. It's a big deal. It's monumental. You know, it's, it's, it's something that, that only happened once in the, in the earth's lifetime, just being completely uh, flooded and, uh, and God pouring out his wrath on the earth at that time. Amen. I mean, so many places you could, you could think of, do you believe the Bible will be literal? Yes, I do. How about this? Because here's the one, you know, that one may not step on very many toes. But how about where the Bible says that if you have a, um, you know, a son that curses their father or mother ought to be put to death. You know what I say? Amen. You know what I say? God is right. You know what I say? That's a good judgment from the Lord. I believe that literally to be true. I believe that that is the judgment that God has given that ought to be instituted by, by a righteous government that's going to have God as their king, that, that's, that that would be righteous. And I believe that when Jesus Christ comes back and sets up his throne and, and we're living back under God's rule and God's law, that that'll be the case then. Yes, it's literal. I'm not going to try to explain it away and say, oh, no, no, we really we don't understand what that means. If you go back to the Hebrew, what it really means is, um, you know, I don't even know what people would try to come up with. They just like ignoring those passages and just cherry pick and just kind of glance over and pretend like it doesn't exist. But the, again, the fundamentalist is going to have the integrity to say, no, I believe all of it. Doesn't matter what other people think or other people say. You know, I, I, part of being fundamentalist, and again, going back to my own personal testimony, I used to think, before I got saved, I used to think that anyone who believed that evolution was false was an idiot. They're imbecile, they're moron, they're uneducated, they're not smart, because I bought the lie hook, line, and sinker growing up and being taught in science class that evolution's a fact. And I didn't question it. I just thought, you know, yeah, okay, this is established science, and I love science, and look, I still love science. But when I got saved, I knew, I wasn't just going, well, I like this part about Jesus, but I don't know about the rest of it. When I got saved, I, I, my, my first, one of my first questions was, well, what about evolution? How, how does that work? Because that, after that moment, I believe the Bible. I believe creation. And then that's the only time I really started to question this other belief. Because even from the beginning, the faith was unwavering that God was true. And then you got to figure out, well, how am I going to reconcile this? And that's when I started to see the actual, the real evidence and start really critically thinking about what I was taught and be, I understand, oh, wow, they don't tell you about the assumptions that are made. They don't tell you, they don't really explain the entire process that goes into the radiocarbon dating. They don't really explain the entire process that goes into how they, they come up with their uh, estimated ages of the earth and, and, and where they found this, you know. They don't go into that much detail. They give you a high-level summary where they gloss over all the details. You know, the details are important because the details have assumptions built into them. That's not science. That's just pretending you know what you're talking about and saying, well, we need this formula to work and we're just going to assume this part. Well, that one part that's missing is a really important part. And again, I mean, this isn't a science because I'm not going to get into all that tonight. But having integrity by believing what the Bible says and having an unwavering faith in those things and taking the Bible literally is important. It's taught by Scripture. I had you turn, did I have you turn to 2 Peter chapter 1? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 19. The Bible reads, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. See, we believe that the Bible is a collection of, of writings from men that spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, which means the Holy Ghost is the author of the Bible. So it's God's word. It's not man's word. This is why we believe in a literal, a strict literal interpretation because 
You just have to accept what it says because it's God's word. We're not going to mess with God's word. He's already thought of the best way to say what he wants to say, and that's how he gave it to us. And we don't have to get into the mind of man and, well, we need to understand the mind of Paul and the culture and everything else. No, it's the Holy Spirit. That's what we need to understand and take it for what it says. We need to take literal. The Bible says no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. It's not up to you to say, well, I think that this means this and, you know, and just give your own interpretation that, that upends what the scripture just literally says on the surface. If you've got a doctrine or a belief that is contradicting what the scripture just says clearly flat out on its face, then your interpretation is wrong and that's some private interpretation and it's not open for private interpretation. Now, obviously, the Bible is very deep, and you can extrapolate further meanings other than just what's on the surface, but you could never go against the surface meaning of the Scripture. I mean, the Bible says what it says. You've got to be able to take it literally. Otherwise, I mean, when you start taking that type of liberty, where is your authority? Your authority ends up becoming your own heart and your own mind as opposed to the Word of God. I don't know about you, but I don't want to place my authority in my heart. I want to place my authority in God's word. Because that's what's solid. I don't want the sinking sand of a wicked heart. I want the, the solid rock of Jesus Christ and his word. Why do we take it literally? Because God doesn't change. Again, the people who don't want to take the word of God literally are going to be the ones that, that think, oh, you have to understand the culture, you have to understand the times. You know, back then, they didn't let women have their, you know, any freedoms, but now we've gotten so much smarter and, and you know, liberated the woman so she could go out and work for a boss and, and, you know, do his will instead of doing the will of her husband at home. There's so much liberation and freedom there. It's so much better. God doesn't change. When what God said back in the Old Testament and his feelings and his thoughts on, on what's right and what's wrong and on morality, and when he says, thus saith the Lord, it doesn't change. In Malachi chapter 3, you could turn if you would to, to um, turn if you would to, turn if you would to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Malachi 3, 5 says, and I will come near to you to judgment and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling and his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts, for I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Now, in the book of Malachi, Hundreds of years have passed since the law of Moses. I mean, many hundreds of years have passed since the law of Moses was given. And yet he's still bringing up, I'm going to be a witness against the sorcerers. I'm going to be a witness against the adulterers. I'm going to, he brings up all of these sins and all these crimes that he's been spelled out as being sins in the Old Testament. He says, I don't change. Yes, I'm still against those things. I don't care how much time has passed. And I'll tell you what, I don't care how much time has passed today. Time isn't some magic additive that just says, oh, now all of a sudden God's changed his mind. God is not like this world. God is not like the, you know, the times that you, they shift and, and bounce around back and forth. This is wrong. This is right. You know, uh, uh, eating eggs is good for you. Eating eggs is bad for you. You know, the science that's going to tell you all these things and shift with the times, even within an own lifetime of, I don't know. I mean, when it comes to food, I'll tell you what, I don't know how many different diets and foods have been. I'm, I'm 43 years old and, and I've lived through so many different fads and, and the, 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 I mean, it's food. Like how much more fundamental can you give just human beings eating food and, and, you know, the world can't even get that right. This is good. This is bad. That's bad. This is good. Calling good evil and evil good from day one. If it can't even get that right, why am I going to listen to you when you're, oh, yeah, God. well, God changes. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. God has his standards. And he said it forth. God is eternal. God doesn't change. And he tells us in scripture that he doesn't change. So, yes, being... Uh, uh, keeping a strict literalism to the Bible is taught by the Bible. It says by itself. And not just that, God's words are not man's words. They're his words. In Jeremiah chapter one, he instructs Jeremiah. 
in verse 6, saying, Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I'm a child. So Jeremiah saying, Hey, I mean, I don't know what to do. I'm a child. What am I going to say? I'm not that smart. I can't go to these people. What am I going to say? And it says in verse 7, But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. See, this is what God wants of his prophets, of, of, of the people who are following him. Just speak what he says. You don't have to worry about coming up with your own words. If he wanted Jeremiah to be very clear about, speak what I tell you to speak, I think what God has to say is very important, and we should just listen to what God had to say. And there's no reason to think that we shouldn't take the word of God literally if he's not telling Jeremiah to add anything to it. Just take what he says. It's what we need. All we need is the word of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 says, For this cause also we thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The next point, so that was the literal, taking the Bible literal, right? Or their beliefs, they're, they're, they're literal. That's part of fundamentalism. Here's the next point, a strong sense of the importance of maintaining in-group and out-group distinctions. That people who are in the group of being a fundamentalist and believing in fundamentals, there's a distinction between you and people who don't believe in those things and don't believe that way, and drawing distinctions between the two. You know what? I believe that's important. And, and then their sentence continues on saying, leading to an emphasis on purity and the desire to return to a previous ideal from which advocates believe members have strayed. So part of fundamentalism is saying, look, there's a difference between the clean and the unclean. And we want to keep pure. We don't want to be defiled. We want to make sure that we have a pure religion that is undefiled and unspotted from the world. We want to make sure that what we believe is right because we care about truth. We care about righteousness. We care about what God said. So yes, we're going to draw distinctions and we're going to draw a line and say, this is right and this is wrong. And we want to know right judgment. That's part of fundamentalism. So yes, we're going to make that distinction. We're going to draw that line. And we're also going to show that, hey, there's a previous ideal. There's an old path. There's an old way. And people have strayed far from that old way. We need to go back to that. That's part of fundamentalism, and we're going to see where the Bible teaches those things. You're in 1 John chapter 2. Look at verse number 15. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard, that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby ye know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. So the Bible here is drawing a distinction between loving the world versus loving the things of the Father. There's a very clear distinction there in what's pure and what's not pure. Hey, the love of the Father, that's pure. And the love of the world is not pure. And he says, love not the world. Don't love those things. There's a very clear distinction being drawn right there of the in-group, right, versus the out-group. The in-group is saying, we need to love God. The out-group is saying, hey, we love the world. And we want to be like the world. And we want to bring the world in here. We want to make everything like the world. No. The Bible's telling us not to do that. Because if you love the world, you don't love the Father. And you know the people who are doing that type of thing are the people that says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. Talk about a group classification there. That there's people that they, were, they came in and then they left from us. But they didn't really believe in the things that we believed, as is evident, because when they went out from us, they started teaching all kinds of other things. You know, it's the people who, they, they claim to believe one thing while they're in the group, then they go out and start teaching, oh, well, Jesus is the Father. Right? And they start teaching all these weird, damnable heresies, 
on who God is and just, you know, whatever. There's all these, all these bizarre things. Look, they went out from us. They were not of us. There is a grouping there. And the Bible's teaching us right here. He says, if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. No doubt. If they had really believed, if they had really been on board, then they would have continued. But they weren't. Because they were infiltrators from the beginning. That they might make manifest that they were not all of us. There is group and classification going on in Scripture right there. And you know what? That's part of the fundamentalist belief also. How about this? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Not just the distinctions of in-group, out-group with us in the world or us in false prophets. You know, part of being a fundamentalist is you're going to draw those distinctions even within the church, even among believers. Because of a, a desire and an emphasis on purity. Now, knowing where to draw the line, where do we get that from? We get that from the scripture. We get that from the word of God. We don't make up our own rules. We don't just say, well, I think this is important for purity and this isn't important for purity and this is where I'm going to draw the line. It's not based on what's in your heart. It's based on what the word of God says. And you know what? 1 Corinthians chapter 5 gives us that line. It's a very clear line on where we draw the line, even within the church among believers, of making an in-group and an out-group based on the purity, with the emphasis on purity. Verse number 9 of 1 Corinthians chapter 5 says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one, no, not to eat. So this is someone who's called a brother. This is someone who's saved. This is someone who comes into church. Hey, brother so-and-so, it's good to see you. Glad you're here with us. And brother so-and-so is a fornicator. He's living with his girlfriend. They're shacking up. He knows what the Bible says. He knows that the Bible contem condemns fornication and condemns it very severely. He keeps showing up. Well, you know what? A fundamentalist is going to say, you know what God's word says? Here's what God's word said. God's word says not to keep company with that man. God's word says in verse 12, for what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? being rebuked and reprimanded for not judging people within the church because that's what God's word says to do. That may not be popular today and most churches out there aren't going to do that because they're going to say, well, we can't judge. They're going to say, hey, everybody welcome. Everybody come on in. We don't care about anything else, anything you're doing in your life. You know, you're a Christian, come on in. You're not a Christian, come on, whatever it is. Just everybody come on in. There's no standards here. That is not the way that God's word says to operate a church not. That's why verse 13 says, but them that are without God judges, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. The wicked person is being referred to the brother in Christ that's guilty of one of these sins. Put him away. I'd say that's drawing a distinction between an in-group and an out-group. The fundamentalist is going to say, I care about the word of God and I know that this is right. So even though it may be uncomfortable or unpleasant to deal with, I'm going to say, sorry, I care more about God's word and being pleasable in the sight of God than I do in the sight of man. And when you understand, when you get to the level where you could go beyond the milk of the word, you'll actually start to understand that obeying these types of principles and these commandments and this doctrine that's being taught here is actually loving towards the person. Because this is a way that's going to help that person get right. And when you read further, and this doesn't include my notes, but when you read further, you understand also that we welcome people who repent and they get right and they change their ways and, they do, and, and then you know, the brother who's guilty of fornication stops fornicating, does the right thing, you know, moves out with, from their girlfriend or gets married or whatever and they get right with God. You know what? We're going to welcome them right back and say, amen, praise the Lord, we're glad you're back. But until that happens, we need to show 
that we do have standards. And there is going to be standards in the house of God. And, you know, children are going to learn, especially new believers. Everyone's going to understand and learn that there's some things that you don't just look the other way about. There's some things we're going to say, you know what, I can't hang out with you. You know what, I can't go out to lunch with you. Sorry, not going to happen. Because you're a wicked person. You're doing some wicked things. I need to put you away from among me because that's what the scripture says to do. And I believe God's word to be wholly true. Yes, it's literal. Yes, it says what it means. There's no dancing around this and trying to say, well, what it really means is that they're just doing something wrong, but they just need to be in the house of God anyways. No, it doesn't. It means it need to be put away. And I mean, talk about something that's not being practiced today in churches. I mean, there's just no standards in almost any church. Sadly, even among many fundamental churches. We need, to, we need to reinvigorate fundamentalism and help people understand what it really means and bring people back to those foundational fundamental truths. And you know, that 1 Corinthians chapter 5, that's not a complicated doctrine. That's not something that you need to be studying the Bible for years and years to really, really, really grasp this. You need to be a doctor of, of the law. You really need to be a, have gone up and down and, and you know, read all these other PhDs. Then you can really understand 1 Corinthians 5. No. It's real simple. There's some things that are just really wicked. Everybody's a sinner, but there's some things that you need to draw a line over and say, you know what? We're not going to tolerate this. Yes, we're going to be intolerant. I know a lot of people suffer from the brainwashing of the world that teaches that tolerance in all things is a virtue, but it's not. It's not. You can be tolerant of many things. You can be long-suffering is a better word. Long-suffering would be a good thing. God's long-suffering. But God does not tolerate everything. And we ought not to tolerate everything either. We have to draw a line. And that's part of, you, you believe that way? You could be a fundamentalist. Turn, if you would, to uh, Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6. The other, one other concept that's part, that's tied in with being a fundamentalist, and according to the definition from Wikipedia, is that there's a return to a previous ideal from which people have strayed. Right? That, hey, this used to be taught. This is the old way of doing things. And people have just wandered off the path, so we need to bring it back and ratchet it back. It's taught in Scripture. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse number 13. The Bible reads, For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. And, you know, when I read Jeremiah and I read about these false preachers and these false prophets, it's like, I feel like this is just happening today. Like we could just very easily be in the days of Jeremiah. When you read through Jeremiah and you're seeing what these false prophets are saying and everyone just, oh, peace be all, oh, everything's good, brother. It's great. You know, no one's preaching on sin. Like Joel Osteen would have been great back in the days of Jeremiah. I mean, he, I mean, he's already doing great. That's why I think it's like the same time. He's doing so great financially and everything else in this world now. Man, he, he'd be just as good back then, if not better. We start reading this. Why? It says, because everyone's given to covetousness. You talk about covetousness. Talk about the guy who's, who's, you know, living the dream with his million, millionaire, billionaire, whatever, mansions and everything else that he's doing. It's all about the love of money for him. Uh, From the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. Verse number 14, they have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. So it says they've healed the hurt slightly. Why? Because people are hurting and you're saying, oh, no, no, it's, everything's going to be okay. It's fine. There's a little, there's a small degree of comfort just hearing someone say everything's going to be fine. But you know what? It's only slightly because it's, it's a false feeling because it's not really going to be okay. When people tell you, oh, everything's going to be okay, you may feel a little bit comforted, but in the end, you're not going to be comforted because in the end, it's just a lie. Like, where's the peace? It felt good for a very short period of time when I believed in that lie. But when the end actually comes, you would have rather that he told you the truth 
so you can prepare yourself and, and other than just thinking, oh, it's all going to be fine. Verse 15, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Again, talk about the, the day that we live in today. There's people committing abominable acts every day and have no shame. And you know what? Not only are they not ashamed, they're proud. They glory in their shame. They're going out and boasting about it and trying to cram it down your throat and cram it down my throat and say, you need to tolerate us, you need to accept us, and that's going to be not enough for them. They say, you need to promote us. And they won't stop at nothing until you do. They weren't ashamed. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall. Their end is coming, too, by the way. You don't need to worry about, about the trouble they're causing now. They've got their end. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. So the Lord is working through Jeremiah here saying, hey, look, the old way, that old path, that old way that was given to you by Moses, that old way that was already delivered unto you, that's the right way. You've strayed real far. You're committing abominations. You know what? That's still true today. The old way, that old path, this old book still holds the truth. It's still right. Hasn't changed. That's the right way. And yes, fundamentalists are going to go back to these old paths. Fundamentalists isn't fundamentalists because you just think that, oh, you know, things were better in the 40s or in the 50s or something like that. No, we're talking way older than that. <laughs> 40s and 50s had their own. Now, it may have been comparatively better than today overall. But you know what? There's still a lot of problems in the 40s and 50s. In the United States of America. We're talking going way back. Really old school. To the ways that the Lord has given on righteousness. Those are the old paths. And you know what? People have strayed from that. People have been straying from that. But we need to try to bring people back to the good way and walk therein so you could find rest for your souls. Verse 17 says, Also I set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not hearken. So it's the warning sound. The trumpet is a warning sound. Hey, listen up. There's judgment coming. You got to get back to the old path. They wouldn't listen. Therefore, hear ye nations, and know congregation was among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. Part of being a fundamentalist is returning to a previous ideal from which people have strayed. It's taught right here in Jeremiah. Turn if you to Romans chapter 16. We're almost done. Romans chapter 16. The last portion of that definition is the rejection of diversity of opinion as applied to these established fundamentals and their accepted interpretation within the group. So within a group of fundamentalists, there is no respect. It's a rejection of having a diversity of opinions on fundamental truths. It's funny because, you know, this, this definition is, is neither, um, you know, good nor bad. It's, it's, it's not, it's one of the reasons why I kind of like it. There's a couple things that make it, that may make it sound like it's leaning towards a bad definition. But overall, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty accurate. It's just how do people interpret it? It's kind of like once saved, always saved. For, in many people's eyes, that's like a slam. That's like, oh man, you're one of those... You know, and they use it pejoratively. They use it in, in a sense that's just like demeaning to you. Like, oh, you're one of those people. Whereas we're like, amen, that's the truth. Fundamentalism, the same thing. You know, people use it in a way like a negative lie. Ne oh, don't tell me you're one of those fundamentalists. <laughs> yeah. What's wrong with, with believing in, in foundational truths and being unwavering on it and saying, you know, we don't change these things. And we don't just allow for every other, every objection to these core doctrines. You have to have a foundation. You have to have a basis of which you say, this is true and we're not going to change from it. We're not, it's not going to shake that faith. We need to be rooted down in the truth. Romans 16 talks about, here, 
How about this diversity of opinion taught in the Bible in Romans 16? Look at verse number 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Oh, but we need diversity of opinion. No. Mark and avoid those people that come in and they try to cause problems and they cause divisions because they're bringing in damnable heresies, because they're bringing in these other opinions on these doctrines that are just solidly held. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. I don't need, you know what, there's a lot of doctrines I don't ever have to revisit. Because once you get them established, once you know that something's true, you don't have to keep going back to it. I mean, it's just as simple as once you finally realize that two plus two equals four, you don't have to keep on going, well, wait a minute. I mean, is it really four? If I have two things over here and two things over here, we put them together. I'm not going to add them up every single time. I know that it's four. Okay, I don't need to go back and question or not, you know, even if I say, you know, so, well, what about, this? what about James chapter two, huh? I don't need to question whether or not that salvation and eternal life is based on my works or is on faith. I don't need to question it. I don't need to doubt that. It's established. It's settled. Done. I don't care what verse you want to try to throw out there. There's some things that are just foundational and not up for debate. And that's part of being a fundamentalist. And Romans 16 says, you know what? Those people that want to cause divisions and bring in these contrary doctrines from what you've learned, avoid them. Mark them. Avoid them. Have nothing to do with them. We're not going to give place to them. Galatians chapter 1. I love, I love Galatians chapter 1. Again, talking about salvation. And you know what? The things I'm talking about, because we don't want to let this thought, the thought process get out of control, right? Fundamentals is still talking about basics, talking about foundational doctrines, talking about all those basic things. We saw it in Hebrews chapter 6, a great list defined in the Bible of what are principal things, what are at that low level of just foundational truth. This doesn't apply to every single doctrine under the sun that you could possibly believe that you just say, mark and avoid everybody if you don't believe exactly like me. <laughs> that's not it. That's, that's not what we believe at all. It's the core things. It's, it's the main things. It's the big things. It's what Roman, or excuse me, Hebrews chapter 6 says. Galatians chapter 1, verse number 6, the Bible says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Now, that's a pretty bold statement. He's saying, I don't care if we come back and tell you, oh, no, no, we were wrong. The gospel is really this. Or even if an angel descends from heaven and says, no, 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 now you've got a different gospel. Now you've got to believe this. He says, let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. That's how solid he's saying, this is right. This is the truth. And you're going to be accursed. And not only does he say it once, he says in the next verse, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, the name you've received, let him be accursed. It's a double cursing. That's how serious it is. And you know what? This, is a, this, this wasn't in here at all, but this just kind of, you know, the Spirit's giving it to me. Sorry. <laughs> the dispensationalists that want to tell you, oh no, there's different gospels. And there's going to be a different way that people are saved in the end times. And then it's going to be by works. You know what? Let them be accursed. Let them be accursed. Because they're bringing another gospel. A gospel that they haven't received. A gospel that you haven't received. You know what? If someone tries to come to me and says, well, you know, people in the end times are going to be saved by their works. You're accursed. Get away from me. You're teaching damnable doctrines. There's an everlasting gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't change. Salvation's always been by grace through faith, no matter when you've lived. Man has never been good enough and will never be good enough to have any part in their own salvation. Never have, never will. It's always been all glory to God. No, but in the tribulation, some glory is going to be to man. Pfft. Blasphemous liar, get out of here, you stinking devil. Let him be accursed. It's fundamentalism. I don't know about you, but I kind of like it. <laughs> I've liked it from day one. I mean, I've been to all kinds of different churches. Not all kinds. I take that back. I've been to many different fundamental Baptist churches. And you know what? I've loved them. I love all of them. All the ones I've been to. 
And some have been better than others, but you know, just people who want to, that, that have integrity with the Word of God, and just want to stand on these, these fundamental truths, and they're going to be unchanging, unmovable. It's not up for debate. It's the right way. It's the truth. And you know what? We don't need to worry about people labeling us a fundamentalist. You ought to be happy to be called a fundamentalist. I am. I'm not going to shy away from that. I'm not going to be like, well, yeah, I'm a fundamentalist. Or, you know, or someone says, are you a fundamentalist? No, no, not really. I mean, you know, Look, don't backpedal. Embrace it. Love it. It's true. It's right. It's taught from Scripture. I mean, every single point in the definition, I went through and showed multiple places in Scripture how the Bible actually is literally teaching that we need to be strong on these things. If the Bible didn't teach this, wouldn't be a fundamentalist. But it does. We're close on this. Turn if you go to Titus chapter 2. Because if you truly are a Christian fundamentalist and you do have integrity and you do believe the word of God, you're not going to be changed on it. You're not going to be moved. And you're going to hold to these truths. You're going to hold to it because it's the word of God. You know it doesn't change. And you treat the word of God and actually apply it to your life and live it like you mean it. Right? You don't just, you're not just a forgetful hearer, but you're a doer of the word. As a Christian fundamentalist, you're going to find yourself different from the vast majority of people in this world. Because you take the Bible literally. Because you don't just blow it off as being, oh, well, that can't be what that means. When the Bible says that, you know, if a man divorces his wife and then gets remarried, he's committing adultery, that can't, I mean, that can't really mean that I can't get remarried. Yeah, that's actually what it means, because that's what it says. You're going to find yourself living very different from the world. Because the world, you don't have a standard. It shifts, it changes. Just like the diet. <laughs> it's going to tell you one thing one day and another thing the next. It doesn't matter. God doesn't. We don't need to worry about being subject to ridicule. Don't, don't let that bother you. We could be of good cheer. Because being different from the world, that's exactly what the Bible teaches also. The Bible teaches it's a good thing. Titus chapter 2, verse number 11, the Bible reads, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. I mean, just think about that first. Denying ungodliness and, and worldly lust means you're going to be different from the rest of the world. Because... The world's given over to worldly lusts. It's coming from the world, and you're denying those things. That inherently will make you different. Verse 12 again, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, Look at this, and purify unto himself a peculiar people. Peculiar means you're different. You're special. Peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. So people want to despise you for being a fundamentalist? Don't let them despise you. You know what? How about you speak and exhort and rebuke? Say, no, being fun, you ought to be a fundamentalist. Don't mock me for being a fundamentalist. You ought to be a fundamentalist. Why aren't you a fundamentalist? What, you, you don't care about the core doctrines of the Bible? You, you think that we can just, they're up for, for debate and you can just change them? You don't think that we should hold those things to be solid? Are you even founded and settled those, or are you just a babe in Christ? We ought to be fundamentalists. We ought to take the word of God literally. We ought to have a foundation that's solid. We ought to make a difference between the in-group and the out-group because we care about purity, because we care about righteous living, and we care about what the Word of God says. I love that we're having a fundamentalist conference. Amen. It's part of who we are. All right, I'm looking forward to all the great preachers that's, that's, that's coming up here. Appreciate the time coming out of this power as I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for giving us your words and that we could have full faith and confidence and trust knowing that 
The Bible's true because you said it. Not because we're trusting in any man or, or any man's wisdom, but that we've received, just as others have in the past, the word of God as it is in truth, that it is the word of God, that, it, that it's not, we're not just trusting in Paul, we're not just trusting in David, we're not just trusting in Moses, we're trusting in you, we're trusting in your words, and that your words never fail, and that your words are here to lead us and teach us and guide us, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to retain purity in our faith, in our belief, that we're not going to let any sinful lusts of the flesh sway our opinions and our mindset on what's right and what's wrong to try to fit that, that particular sin, but that we would have integrity and purity knowing that, no, we're going to stick to what your word says because we know that to be true and that these things are not up for debate, dear Lord. We love you. I thank you so much for bringing everyone here together safely. God, I pray that you please be with everyone as we go our separate ways this evening. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.